Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Naomi Lopez, and I'm Director of Healthcare Policy at the Goldwater Institute. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this R Street event for promoting healthcare access, affordability, and autonomy, what states can do. Of course, we're in unprecedented times with the COVID-19 crisis. We have come a long way in just one year, but we still have a lot of challenges ahead. And one of the most important lessons that we are seeing in real time every day, particularly for those frontline workers who are treating this illness, is that the federal flexibilities that were provided with a public health emergency at the federal level, as well as state actions by governors and some legislatures that allow for a, healthcare professionals to practice at the top of their education and training has really had an impact on the front lines of this crisis. That is why today we are talking about this issue. Today, we had the privilege of being joined by Courtney Jocelyn, who's a resident fellow of R Street, and Dr. Jeffrey Singer. He is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a visiting fellow in healthcare policy at the Goldwater Institute. And they recently authored a paper addressing some of these important issues. So let's start today by talking about how we got to where a brief history of how we came to have the drug prescribing system that we now do in the US. And this is particularly relevant today because as we know, there are no FDA fully approved treatments for COVID-19 and there are no fully approved FDA vaccines for it either. The two vaccines that are now being administered in the States are under emergency authorization. So I really would like to go back to the beginning with Dr. Jeffrey Singer to tell us a little bit about the history and how drugs used to be evaluated, why they're evaluated they are now. Dr. Singer. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Naomi and Courtney. Um, a lot of people probably don't realize this, but uh, as recently as 1951, um, people actually had the ability to uh, walk into a pharmacy uh, sometimes they had in their hand a, a written prescription from one of their healthcare practitioners, like a doctor, uh, decide whether or not to follow that doctor's uh, advice or maybe seek the advice of the pharmacist. And um, they were able to obtain a lot of medications, including those that were prescribed, without having to get a prescription. It wasn't until 1951 that it, it was made that the, uh, the Congress through what was called the Durham-Humphrey Amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, um, made it the case that starting in 1951, the Food and Drug Administration will decide what drugs shall be available to individuals either by, by only by prescription from a healthcare practitioner licensed by the state, as opposed to which drugs uh, patients can obtain on their own over the counter. And the... Uh, uh, th this was a, a matter of, of basically a patient autonomy. Uh, dating back to the beginning of this country, everyone ex uh, respected the rights of individuals to self-medicate. And when the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was originally passed in 1938, it specifically stated that nothing in this act is intended to uh, in any way infringe upon the rights of individuals to self-medicate. It's only to guarantee that their self-medication is safe. But, uh, and so pharmaceutical companies oftentimes on their own would decide, you know, this is a complicated medication. If somebody doesn't use it as we want them to, they're gonna get into trouble, we're gonna get sued. So pharmaceutical companies on their own would decide this should be only sold to someone with a prescription. But that was a decision made by the pharmaceutical company. Starting in 1951, that decision was taken out of the hands of the pharmaceutical companies and placed in the hands of the Food and Drug Administration. From that point forward, it was the government, oftentimes influenced by politics and special interest pleading, that would decide what people can actually get on their own versus what they have to go to uh, effectively a government uh, assigned, government licensed gatekeeper to get permission to medicate themselves. And to this day now, there are drugs in, in this country that you can't get without a prescription that you can in other countries. For example, you can get insulin without a prescription in Canada. In about 100 countries, you can get birth control pills and other oral contraceptives without a prescription. Um, and the list goes on and on. Uh, to this day, naloxone, the overdose, opioid overdose antidote, still requires a prescription, whereas in, uh, 
Italy, Australia, and Canada doesn't. So a lot of this is arbitrary. A lot of it's based on politics. Um, but the requirement to get a prescription, of course, adds a lot to uh, make it costly for patients and less uh, convenient because people oftentimes have to take time off from work and spend money on a doctor's visit and spend hours sometimes waiting to get access to a medication that they know exactly what they want. So Courtney, um, in your paper that you and Dr. Singer co-authored, you talked just very briefly about how the role that pharmacists play internationally in other countries. We often think of the United States as being this liberty, the, the speaking of liberty and individual autonomy. But in reality, when we look at the pharmacy space, pharmacists play a very different role in other healthcare systems. And as Dr. Singer alluded to, um, there's a lot more ability for an individual to just walk in and get the prescription that they, that they need. Can you talk a little bit about the, the international comparisons of the role that pharmacists play as well as an individual's ability to, to obtain, easily obtain without a lot of gatekeepers, the, tr the treatment that they're seeking? Sure. So um, as you're saying, pharmacists are kind of considered uh, what is what was deemed the third way, right, where you have a model kind of between um, prescription only from a physician and uh, complete over the counter status for medication. And the reason that became more popular was simply that pharmacists are oftentimes more accessible than doctors are. Um, and there are often medications that are pretty low risk. And as Dr. Singer mentioned, you know, patients understand the medication they're taking. Um, and so it became sort of unnecessary to have this uh, higher prescription barrier physician only or nurse practitioner in the case of the US. Um, and so what we saw internationally was that more types of medications were opening up to this pharmacist, uh, not, you can call it pharmacist prescribed. In some cases, it was mostly pharmacist advised, right? Like you can still um, in some countries go to another or go to a pharmacy and uh, ask the pharmacist to advise you on which medication they think you should take. Um, and I think some people consider this to be the pharmacists are giving out medical advice, right? Which, which makes us uncomfortable a little bit because we think, oh, they're not doctors. Um, but the fact is they are medication experts. They are quite literally trained to understand, you know, medication, its interactions um, and the various contraindications for medication. And so in a lot of cases, this just made sense from, a, from an efficiency standpoint. It wasn't the case that some of these drugs were so risky that we couldn't have pharmacists prescribe them. Um, and so this international model that we've seen has kind of slowly trickled over uh, to the US in, in terms of pharmacists being able to do more under their license with prescribing medication. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Singer has anything to add there. I know he's also done a lot of extensive work on the international variations in, in uh, pharmacist prescriptions. Yeah, and if I must say, as a practicing physician, I, got, I have to tell you that the pharmacists are actually in many cases, more knowledgeable than we physicians are on medications, particularly medication interactions. And it's not unusual in a hospital setting, the hospital pharmacist will often be a part of the team accompanying the team of uh, doctors and nurses going from patient to patient on intensive care unit patients. Uh, and when we're, we're going over their lists of medications and seeing if we need to make adjustments, we're always actually asking the pharmacist. And as even in the ambulatory setting, uh, I'll have patients in my office uh, with a certain problem and I, I need to prescribe something for them. And I'll oftentimes phone the pharmacist and consult the pharmacist to tell them, well, you know, what medications I'm, I'm on, uh, I have my patient on, what, what we're looking to, to accomplish. Uh, and the pharmacist will advise me as which drugs may work better with the drugs that the patient's on. So people think of a pharmacist these days is somebody who works, uh, you know, in a supermarket and counts pills and puts them into from one jar into a smaller jar. In fact, these are people who are highly trained uh, in pharmacology and, and the interactions of drugs. And oftentimes they actually catch us when we prescribe something that interacts with something a patient's on and phone us. So um, we were not taking full advantage of the, of the, of the skills they have to offer us. So um, I wanted to remind the audience that if you have any questions for our panelists, please use the question and answer function of the webinar. And I, we would be happy to throw these questions out there during the course of, of this event. So now that we've kind of taken a little peek at the international variations, we do know that schedule practice is under state authority. 
state lawmakers have the authority and responsibility to govern the practice of medicine within their state borders. Can you both talk a little bit about, um, particularly in your specific research areas, the variations between the states, what we see in terms of the in terms of patient freedom and scope of practice limitations, as well as you know, prior to the pandemic, and what your thoughts are as to how COVID nineteen might push and might it might actually accelerate change in scope for and specifically for pharmacists. And Courtney, I know you've done a lot of work in the birth control area. Dr. Singer, I know you've done a, a lot of work in the opioid addiction area. Um, those are kind of the two, um, the, the, the two most controversial, which shouldn't be controversial, but are controversial areas. Can you kind of lead into this discussion kind of with your specialty and then talking more broadly about where you see these reforms going in the future? Let's start with you, Jordan, with you, Courtney. Yeah, so what we saw kind of before the pandemic um, and specifically in the world of birth control is uh, an increase in popularity among uh, legislators and state uh, agencies and just citizens in general in the idea of pharmacists being able to prescribe hormonal birth control. Um, and this move has gone, really the first time it was implemented was like around 2015, 2016. And since then we now have, I think it's 17 states that allow, or 16 states plus Washington DC um, that allow pharmacists to prescribe birth control. And the states do it differently in some cases. Some states have age restrictions saying that you cannot get a, a prescription from a pharmacist for birth control unless you're 18 or older. Um, some states also have uh, safeguards in place that say if you are getting a prescription from a pharmacist, you do have to provide evidence that you've seen a primary care physician um, every three years. Um, and we also see uh, that, you know, pharmacists are required to basically notify patients of the importance of seeing a primary care physician. And the reason this has grown in popularity is, again, kind of what we've seen elsewhere, which is the idea that something that is highly effective and relatively low risk for the majority of the population seeking birth control makes it a good candidate for uh, less restricted access. And we see this, as Dr. Singer said, of around 100 countries internationally allow birth control to be available um, either over the counter or de facto over the counter. And so, you know, we're slowly moving toward that on a state by state basis. Um, but well, I will say too, just for anyone who's maybe not familiar, um, the difference between over-the-counter and pharmacist prescribing status is over-the-counter is truly over-the-counter. There's no uh, medical professional who is giving you any sort of um, consultation on this. And then pharmacist prescribing is they, they are uh, beholden to a set of standards that they have to uh, fulfill in order to give you a prescription. So with that, we're kind of moving to this pharmacist prescribing model with birth control. Um, and it's growing in popularity, but it's also seen some differences in success. And this is often uh, due to the way states implement pharmacists being able to prescribe birth control, um, which we can get into at a different time. I could talk about that all day, but um, that's what we've seen before the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, what's been really interesting, and I think this is, comes as no surprise to most of us, is that all of a sudden states were sort of throwing out all of these regulations on certain things to do with pharmacists. So for example, um, a lot of states, state governors issued executive orders for the beginning of the pandemic um, last March that said pharmacists can refill um, sort of routine medications even without doctor approval for certain amounts of time. And this was because right as we entered the first phase of uh, social distancing and lockdowns, um, people weren't able to see their doctor and in a lot of cases have these sort of routine, but in many cases, life-saving medications um, that they were unable to get a prescription refilled for. So basically it said the pharmacist has the discretion to issue uh, emergency refills for medication. So that was one example. Um, we also saw a lot of uh, changes, uh, even including more recently around pharmacy techs and pharmacy interns being allowed to sort of do more under their license um, in the pharmacy. And this was this is largely to do with the vaccine, which again, we can get into later, but um, largely had to do with there's a supply issue. There's simply a supply issue of, of medical professionals who were able to do some of this. And so that's what we've seen in pharmacists specifically, but we've also seen in general, just the, the regulatory environment for 
medical professionals in states has changed drastically in a year. And although the majority of these changes are temporary, now I think we're starting to see people recognizing the importance of having these reforms made permanent, because if they had been, we wouldn't have had to spend all this time issuing emergency orders um, and, and figuring out basically how to get people access to the care that they need. Uh, instead, we could have just like dove right into it. And so I think that's kind of opened up, the pandemic has really opened up the regulatory um, reform, I guess you could maybe even say Overton window on this, where it's kind of shifted to say, here's what we've done. And we did these very quickly. Um, and we've had success with a lot of them. And so we need to now examine which ones need to stay forever um, and which ones maybe aren't as important. But I, it's really made the case, I think, for why it's important to examine the level of autonomy that both the medical professionals have and patients as well um, in being able to get these services in, especially in times of crisis. If I could just add a couple of things there. Um, when, when it comes to Oral contrac hormonal contraceptives being available over the counter. Uh, many people may not realize this, but for over 10 years, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has called for it being available over the counter. They've actually stated, you don't need to come in for an annual exam unless you have some pre-existing condition that makes that necessary. You should be able to, you don't have to come see me. So is the American Academy of Family Practice. Mm -hmm. Yet despite that, the FDA has not made it available over the counter. This is what's happened when the, when the, the government took the authority away from the individual patient and from the, the manufacturer to make their own proprietary decisions. And the government now decides how you can medicate it it's in violates violates the our fundamental right to self-medicate so here you got a situation where if the american council of obstetrics and gynecology is saying you don't know, need to come see me to get contraceptives now they're giving up money by saying that there's actually they have an incentive to say it's a good idea come, to come see me and they're saying you don't need to yet the, the food and drug administration food and drug administration is not making it available over the counter and a lot of uh a lot of the uh, regulations that have been suspended by governors during the, the course of this pandemic, that amounts to a tacit admission that the regulations stand in the way of getting health care to people. So other things that the uh, governors have done uh, regard, regarding pharmacists is virtually every, I think every state allows pharmacists to give vaccinations to people, but the states differ as to what vaccinations they can give and whether or not they can give it to young people under certain ages and that sort of thing. Just recently, uh, the Health and Human Services Department, I think it was November, maybe a little earlier than that last year, they issued a, uh, a, an executive uh, order saying that because it was becoming obvious that a lot of young children were missing their essential uh, vaccination appointments. And this could lead to a lot of problems down the road. Kids weren't getting their, you know, their MMR vaccines and polio, et cetera. Um, the part, Secretary Azar in the, in the uh, previous administration said that during the pandemic, pharmacists can prescribe to the young ages as well, because you want to get those kids vaccinated. So, um, and, and so when you have these regulators temporarily suspending their, these barriers, what's it telling us? It's telling us these barriers are for the most part political. And, and, and it's what we call in the state's scope of practice laws, where you have the state has the authority under our constitutional system to license healthcare professionals. At the same time, when it does so, the state has the authority to decide what each profession may or may not do. It kind of assigns them to different silos. And a lot of that has to do with different special interest pleading and the different competing health professions basically vying over turf. And uh, some professions don't want others treading into their territory, uh, you know, for reasons that shouldn't require explanation. So um, this provides us with a great opportunity because we, we've all gotten a lesson from the pandemic that the scope of practice laws have interfered with people getting access to healthcare. And uh, a person who's on the front lines, oftentimes in our supermarkets, is able to give us care. Uh, and we need to allow these people to, to practice to the extent to which they've been trained. So um, just to provide a little bit more clarification about the different tools that lawmakers and policymakers 
are using in the midst of this pandemic. And I will point out that none of these tools are new. We've seen them before with other you know, health emergencies. Uh, for example, H1N1, we had all these same tools. The big difference is that we have a far more damaging pandemic this time around, and um, it's also lasting much longer. And so that those are the two big key differences. It's not that any of these policies are new, we've seen them before, but it's been quite a while. Um, people's memories are pretty short when it comes to healthcare. Um, but so, so at the federal level, as soon as the public health emergency last year was declared by Secretary Azar, they were able to immediately under that emergency authority, provide federal flexibilities in a wide array of areas. And they did so. And one of these areas was scope of practice as it relates to reimbursements for Medicare, Medicaid, state uh, children's health insurance program. And so these flexibilities at the federal level are a bit distinct from the flexibilities at the state that, that we saw governors providing. Now, some of the, the, the tools that governors have available are emergency management acts, which are in statute already. And for example, um, in the state of Arizona, the Arizona's Emergency Management Act allows for uh, healthcare providers to automatically come into the state and practice. And you know, there's a lot of restrictions on that, but um, but that's already in law. As soon as the as soon as the emergency is declared, that is that kicks in right away. In a lot of states, though, states were relying on executive orders, where state governors have enormous autonomy in the and and. Um, and uh, authority to make changes without legislative action. And they do so through executive orders. And so that's the other tool. And I think what we're looking at now, looking forward, is what, what can be done to make these changes that are good policy in a pandemic that we know will continue to be good policy after the pandemic ends to make them permanent. And that's why there's so much discussion about scope of practice on the state level, because primarily, you know, you do need federal action as it relates to Medicare, Medicaid, and the state children's health insurance program. But outside of that, you also need state action for the scope of practice areas. And when it comes to vaccines, the federal the federal um, guidance is, 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 you know, you still need state action. The states still have to act, and they are acting, of course. But we do, we are now seeing a situation which I think really emphasizes the need for changes in scope of practice as they relate to pharmacy, where you've got to have more people available to provide vaccines. We know from CDC data that people aren't getting vaccinated. People are fearful of going into healthcare settings right now. And, and so at the end of this, we are going to have the threat of these types of illnesses and diseases that we haven't seen in a long time. And that's particularly scary. So you've got a pandemic on top of other healthcare threats that might emerge. So one of the really interesting things about COVID-19 and the crisis is that we were seeing a lot of movement from democratic governors. We had a lot of democratic governors actually taking the lead on changing scope of practice for a lot of healthcare providers. And part of that was due to the fact that the more blue states were getting hit harder earlier in this crisis. But it was interesting to see that there was a recognition um, that, that it's good policy. So when we take a look at things like scope of practice as it relates to birth control, as it relates to addiction issues, um, we have actually seen some movement in states that are considered typically very conservative, very red states. For example, you had um, you had Utah uh, provide behind the counter birth control. Can you talk about those trends that we were seeing prior to the pandemic and what that might mean going forward in terms of red states, blue states, and reforms? Who goes first? <laughs> I, I can chime in. I yeah. I will say you know it obviously depends on the um, type of reform we're talking about, and that sort of tells us where blue states or red states trend. For example, with birth control, red states um, are far fewer when it comes to allowing pharmacists to prescribe birth control. Um, and there's slower uptake in red states in general, um, which is pretty predictable. I think that makes sense um, just from a political standpoint. I'm not surprised by that, but you do see blue states sort of embracing some of these changes a little bit better, but that's not always the case. Um, so 
you know, there's still, regardless of uh, the political majority in any state, there are still these um, groups that speak out against the um, safety of allowing or opening up sort of the scope of practice for other medical professionals. And, you know, we're, we're primarily talking about pharmacists, but you can really be talking here about um, about nurse practitioners, about even just registered nurses or physician assistants. There are so many different restrictions um, on each of these licensed medical professionals to practice within their state. And of course, you know, uh, you say, well, that's great. Uh, obviously, med like medicine is a very highly regulated field. And I think a lot of people think that if there's any field that should be maybe highly regulated, that makes sense, right? It just intuitively. But the problem is when you really dig into all these restrictions on medical professionals, you start to see the discrepancies among states. States are not uniform in these restrictions, which suggests that some of these might be arbitrary or as Dr. Singer has said, are uh, uh, the outcomes of political forces basically. Um, and so the fact that there are so many differences among the states suggests that again, beyond red and blue states, there are forces at work that are restricting different medical professionals from doing things um, that they're perfectly fine to do. One example of this is just the um, ratio of, let's say, pharmacists to pharmacy techs or pharmacy interns. States dictate how many techs or interns a pharmacist can supervise at one time. And of course, this uh, affects a pharmacist's ability to uh, to delegate, you know, duties and responsibilities, even with the vaccine, for example, um, and this kind of goes back to what Dr. Singer was saying about how it's kind of a tacit admission that maybe some of this is unnecessary. So just recently, uh, with the COVID vaccine, now pharmacy tax and pharmacy interns are allowed to administer the vaccine as well. So you're kind of seeing this, this rush to allow these people to do certain things like administer vaccines. Um, and they're, you know, they're beholden to, they have to be CPR certified. They have to have taken some sort of training. If there's no training that's specified and there's one that, that uh, HHS says this is acceptable. So there are these things that with very small amounts of even of training, additional training, we can allow these professionals to do these things. So even if people are concerned about the safety and there's a consensus about the safety, allowing some of these incremental things uh, is a way to open that up. And so I think on the state level, I, I my hope is that we'll see a lot more red states embrace this because to me, that makes the most sense. And the reason that makes the most sense is that um, those who are you know on the political right um, or right of center, we are supposed to be the people who are concerned about government overreach about you know, the, the ability of the individual to make their decisions, especially in something like healthcare, it's so important and so personal. Um, we're also supposed to be concerned about overregulation, which as this pandemic has shown us, there is a lot of overregulation in the states on healthcare uh, access. And this is um, also proven by the fact that there was, there's been so much confusion on both the state and federal levels, right? When when uh, the federal government, if, the H if HHS issues an order saying that pharmacists can now do this, but pharmacists in a certain state weren't allowed to do that before, they're all of a sudden confused. Like, who am I, who, who am I being held accountable to for this? And so there also creates that friction there where people just don't know how to mobilize. Um, and it's, you know, really, I don't think can be overstated how pharmacists can be of service during this time. So one of the things that's really interesting to me is that throughout my work on pharmacists, particularly prescribing birth control is of the primary interest to me um, because that just, that was such a, um, it, it's kind of a no brainer in a lot of ways. But what's been so interesting is how when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden pharmacy drive-throughs were like a lifeline, right? Like we were testing in, in drive-throughs. It was allowing people to be socially distanced. Pharmacists were able to actually like be with patients without having to like be in the office with them, which is exactly the kind of infrastructure you want for things like this. And so it became clear that pharmacists were providing sort of an integral role in alleviating the pandemic. And I, I, my hope is that this helps those in various states who have higher restrictions on pharmacists, for example, that um, 
it's harder to make the case that we should go back to the way things were, right? That the status quo should be maintained. I think that's incredibly hard to argue now. Um, and my hope is that that doesn't happen on the state level. And again, I hope that red states are the ones who really sort of pick up this, uh, this issue because again, they're the ones who are supposed to be concerned about the fact that government is it has too heavy of a hand in saying what you can and cannot do with a license. Um, and so being able to sort of roll back some of these regulations is gonna be really helpful. I'd like to just chime in. There are some red states, for example, Tennessee and West Virginia are among, and Utah are among the states that are allowing pharmacists to prescribe uh, um, oral contraceptives. But just not long ago, Florida became, I think, the 17th or 18th state to allow pharmacists to perform tests and prescribe treatment for the flu and for strep throat. Now, in some states, there's they require you to have some sort of collaborative agreement with a healthcare practitioner, but others don't. For example, Idaho has no collaborative practice agreement, neither does New Mexico in that respect. But how many people uh, watching this have could remember the time when they, they knew exactly what their problem was? They know they have another case of a strep throat and it, they have to actually take time off, go make an appointment with a doctor, for that doctor to perform the tests that they know how to perform themselves because they know it's just a a throat swab test, and then prescribe for them the exact medication that they know they want, and how much time and money did that cost? I've had situations, I'm a surgeon, I've had patients come to me to have their sutures taken out after surgery, who then say, could you do me a favor, doc? I know this isn't what you do, but I'm having another ear infection, and every time I get that, I, I, I go on amoxicillin, and it takes care of it, and I just don't have the time to make an appointment with my doctor. Could you prescribe amoxicillin for me? And I, a lot of times I say, what's the dose that you take? And they tell me, and I prescribe it. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So here you can go to a pharmacist and get that done. Um, and uh, how about people wanting to get to TB skin tests, which uh, more and more people are needing for work? Uh, that's that's the kind of thing that pharmacists are, are you know, well qualified to perform. And in several states, pharmacists are allowed to provide T TB skin tests. So you could be, you know, doing your sharp shopping in the supermarket. Uh, and before you leave, making sure you go over to the pharmacy counter and get your TB skin test that you need for work. Why would you have to make an appointment with a doctor's office for that? kind? And there's a whole host of things. And these are things that have nothing to do with the pandemic. Although with the advent of the pandemic, governors have been temporarily allowing these things to happen. Also, we're seeing, this has been only blue states, um, but the country is witnessing a surge in HIV cases. And, and, and um, there are two drugs, one is called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, and the other is post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP, and they're dramatically effective in preventing the development of HIV, uh, both from uh, sexual uh, uh, transmission or from even sharing needles. And um, in California first and now in Colorado, those states have said that pharmacists can prescribe PrEP and PEP. Um, they have very minimal uh, side effects. Um, of course, um, it's important that if, if you think you might have HIV, then you, you should go get tested for it. But there are actually at-home HIV tests that you can buy over the counter for, for personal use. You shouldn't. You don't have to go to a doctor for the HIV test. But obviously, if you're concerned enough that you may be that you may be exposed to HIV, to want a pharmacist to give you the prep, then you probably should be concerned enough to want to get tested for it. And there we go. More, there are plenty of tests that pharmacists can pre perform, and now they're being allowed to for COVID. But why shouldn't they be able to perform these kind of tests all the time? Saliva tests, etc. And just to add to that really quick, you know, with, with PrEP and PEP, it's, it's such an example, and birth control too, it's such an example of how something that is so low risk, but so effective from preventing things that can really set back people's lives is still under this model in a lot of cases of only physicians being able to administer them. So it, it's the, to me that like the economic calculation is off. If you're saying that, hey, this, you know, birth control is preventing unintended pregnancy, um, which in turn has all these positive effects, right? If you are truly, if you're truly wanting to avoid pregnancy and, um, you know, you are able to, that's going to help your economic opportunities, going to help your educational opportunities. It's going to help you and your family decide how you want to, how you want to plan for your future. All of these things from such a simple change 
um, that just sort of is, you know, bolstering access to birth control. And the same with PrEP and PEP. It's such a, a, a low risk uh, proposal for something that has such a huge impact on people's lives. And so you kind of start thinking about how, why are we still acting as though we need these gatekeepers that are that we don't need to have in place anymore. Um, and the same can be said, you know, one of the interesting things is with Narcan, as we've talked about briefly, but right, the idea was that uh, the opioid antagonist is, it's an emergency situation. It's not something that you can wait on for a doctor's prescription and, you know, hope that this happens in the time that someone uh, is experiencing an overdose, let's say. Same thing we've seen with emergency contraception, like with plan B, um, it, it then became over the counter because it was recognized that this is a matter of time. Uh, time is of the essence in this case, uh, the same with Narcan. And so, it, you know, we're slowly seeing this with these like emergency drugs, but it, it, it can't be understated that these emergency drugs are great for better access, but why are we not doing things that are better able to prevent you having to deal with that in the first place? So like regular contraception. Speaking um, of plan B, it took 12 years for plan B to become over the counter for all ages, despite the fact that the FDA actually recommended it, but they were overruled by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and by, by the, in the Obama administration, it took a court order. So again, when, the, when, when Congress took away the right of individuals to, to decide how to medicate themselves and put, it, put the authority with the government to decide who gets who gets to decide, um, then inevitably politics comes into play. So here you had a situation with Plan B where the FDA and all of its advisory boards thought it should be available over the counter, but that didn't matter. Just like the American College of Aesthetics and Gynecology thinks oral contraception should be over the counter. It doesn't matter. So it's not about the science, it's about politics. And I think it's important to circle back to our original point. Um, you know, up until the 1950s, it was considered a, a given that every individual had the right to self-medicate. In fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson was uh, reported as saying to a group uh, in early American days when trying to explain to them how important uh, it was, the right to free speech was. He actually, to describe it, he said, it's as sacred as our right to self-medicate. Everybody understood that. Now we have to, we've come full circle and we have to say, our right to self-medicate is as important as our right to free speech. Now on the state level, we can't do anything to, to overturn the federal uh, re regulations that impinge, infringe on our rights to self-medicate. But what we can do on the state level is make, is make it easier for people to get access at less expense to drugs because the states still have the power to decide which licensed professional can provide the permission slip. It doesn't have to be somebody in an office that you have to take time off from work for. It can be somebody in the pharmacy in your neighborhood supermarket. So um, I, I kind of want to uh, kind of tie some of this back together. Um, so before, before we had ever heard of COVID-19, we already knew that the farm, that retail pharmacy and big box pharmacy were already preparing for the entrance of Amazon cash pharmacy into the market. And so they were already starting to push this idea of having pharmacists play a greater role in primary health care. This was happening before the pandemic. And it, you know, we certainly know it wasn't a matter of if, but when Amazon was going to enter the cash pharmacy business. And these retailers understood perfectly well that if Amazon is delivering your medication to your front door and you don't have to leave. You don't have to walk into Walgreens and CVS and pick up your prescription, which always means, at least for me, that you spend $50 on other items before you get out the door, in addition to your prescription. And so they were already reimagining the retail experience at the pharmacy. So now, in, in part of the importance of care at the pharmacy, if you're in a rural area, if you don't have access to enough healthcare providers, you've got a lot of shortages. You've got most Americans living very clo in close proximity to retail pharmacy. This, these changes were already moving in this direction and pharmacy scope was one of those areas that we hadn't seen much reform in. I mean, we already have dental therapists, we have nurse practitioners, 
we have pharmacists, we have uh, physician assistants, we have all these other kind of mid-level providers. And pharmacy was kind of like the last group that hadn't seen this massive um, evolution in the care that they provide. Can you talk a little bit about what you see going forward in terms of what the pharmacy experience might look like in just a few short years as a result of Amazon entering cash pharmacy, as a result of pharmacists being kind of like this last, um, last group that hadn't seen significant reform, and of course the COVID crisis um, impacting this experience. Want me to go first? Sure, go ahead. I, 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 see, I see the trend continuing. Like I say, we have uh, Colorado recently allowed pharmacists to prescribe PrEP and PEP and several other states have pending legislation. More and more states are allowing pharmacists to prescribe uh, contraceptives. Um, the, the ability of pharmacists to vaccinate people is, is, is expanding, to perform tests on people. So I think this, this trend will continue. I think uh, we could expect, I mean, let's be realistic. There's going to be pushback from some of the competing uh, licensed healthcare professions. Uh, some of them are going to honestly believe that it's not safe that they don't know enough. And some of them are just gonna be motivated uh, by the fact that they don't like the competition with their own field. Um, and uh, it's also important for, for the patients to realize, well, it's important for the pharmacists to realize that just because they have been uh, permitted by their license to prescribe certain things, doesn't mean that they must do so if they don't feel comfortable in, with a particular situation. I mean, I'm licensed to practice medicine and, and, and I'm a specialist in general surgery, but every once in a while, I'll see a patient with a complicated enough problem where I don't feel comfortable handling that problem and refer them to somebody I know who is. That's, that's what being a professional is all about. So if people are worried that pharmacists may do something you know, dangerous or, make, or, or kind of go get in over their head, Pharmacists don't want to get in over their head. They have their own eth professional ethics and their own liability concerns. And so if they don't feel comfortable uh, prescribing something to, to a, a person, they're not under no obligation. Yeah, these are usually opt-in systems for pharmacists too. And there's usually additional training that comes along with it um, if you want to become a prescriber. So you have that as well. And I think, you know, it's it, it just comes down to what, opposing forces will say to push back on some of this. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the two things we always heard pr prior to the pandemic about, in, you know, expanding scope of practice, especially for pharmacists, let's say, is that it's just not safe. They're not doctors, uh, they're not medical doctors, and so they shouldn't be prescribing medication. And I mean, again, there's been no evidence of anything that they've been, that they're able to prescribe as being less safe. Um, in fact, with birth control, um, in a study, there was they compared uh, pharmacists giving prescriptions for birth control versus physicians, and actually, physicians were more likely to still prescribe hormonal birth control if a patient presented with some contraindication. So, pharmacists were actually being a little more um, uh, reserved in some of their prescribing practices. Now, of course, you can say, well, okay, that you know maybe we don't want them to be, but the the point stands that there's been nothing showing that they're just throwing out prescriptions like it's candy. Um, which is important, you know, for, for maintaining the safety um, and the efficacy of allowing them to prescribe. And I think, you know, what we'll see or what we've seen now is with the pandemic, there's simply no evidence for these arguments that it's not safe to allow pharmacists to take on more duties. And in fact, we've repeatedly gone back to the, the pharmacy industry and ask them to do more during this pandemic. So the fact that we're relying on them so heavily should indicate that um, it's sort of disingenuous to think that some of these proposals that I hope we'll see in the states, you know, this year and the coming years to sort of open up scope of practice a little bit is important. And to, to your example, Dr. Singer, about, you know, if there's a patient with a problem that's too uh, that's complex and not something you feel comfortable with and they can see somebody else. This is where also uh, the importance of telehealth has come into play in the States, right? It, which point, is yeah. the cost of, right, if I was coming to you for something and I had a problem and then, you know, you were like, this is really more of a problem for this type of doctor. I'm then having to do these two different doctor's visits. I think if anyone on here has ever had to make a doctor's visit, you know, it's not, not the easiest thing in the world, especially with timing. 
Um, and so the fact that telehealth, the, the sort of expansion of telehealth over the last year has shown to how much that can reduce the overall cost to patients seeking health services. Um, and of course, we don't have to get into like all the ins and outs of telehealth and what's happened there in the states. But overall, we've seen states basically say, okay, we're going to allow all kinds of different professionals to use telehealth services. We're going to cover a lot of it with insurance. Um, and it, it's it's become popular not only among patients, but also among many providers. And so I think that's another thing that's important to point out is that hopefully as these things become more popular and we have evidence that they're very popular, we can then start to uh, see states implement them permanently. So to your question, Naomi, about what will the pharmacy experience be like, um, I think it will be, I am optimistic, honestly, that we have these uh, retail pharmacies already sort of considering the challenge of competition. And of course, there are a few ways to beat your competition. One is to uh, regulate them out of existence, which is a popular model for a lot of uh, <laughs> industries, um, as we all are aware. And then the other one is to outcompete them, to simply be better at what you do. And so I, that's for the, you know, for the patient experience, I think that's going to be extremely important. The fact that these two competitors with Amazon and then the big chains like, you know, CVS, Walgreens um, are competing against each other. I think you're going to end up with a much more streamlined um, process. And, you know, the more pharmacists can do in terms of prescribing or giving simple tests, the more that these pharmacies are going to be able to implement the infrastructure that's required to do those as well. That's the other thing too, right? Having that regulatory, um, the confidence that the regulatory uh, infrastructure is going to remain as a certain thing, then allows you to invest in this sort of thing. So for example, just really quickly with telehealth, the problem with a lot of doctors is they were saying, yeah, this is great for now, but like, if I'm going to streamline my practice into having a telehealth component, I need to know that there's going to be regulatory certainty that telehealth is going to remain um, accessible. And if not, right, then there's no point in investing in being able to provide these services or being trained in certain telehealth services. So that's the other thing. I think if we're going to have a, a better and improved pharmacy uh, setting for patients in a few years, we need states and the, and federal regulators to kind of step up and and ensure um, that whatever's happening is is for the long run, so that we can start to see those improvements um, with pharmacies. Yeah, I'd also like to say another advantage of the pharmacies is that the pharmacies are come to, are, are closer to the patients, so, so there's a much more of a convenience and the, and the. The, the delivery of these vaccines during the pandemic now, there's an excellent illustration. So we had situations we all read about where, where the people vaccinating people have leftover vaccine because people didn't keep their appointments. And the, the vaccines we're using now, once the vial's open, you got about five hours to use it before it spoils. And you have to discard perfectly good vaccine and we're trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So in, in the, usual setting like is being used in a lot of states where people in, are in cars online in giant parking lots to stadiums and that kind of thing well if the people handing out the vaccine realize they got a lot of xx vaccine that they're going to have to discard how are they going to get the word out come in quickly i got some vaccine to give away same thing even with doctors offices which i think should be equipped with the vaccine as well but when you're, I know some real life examples of this where uh, in, in various uh, states where the pharmacies have been permitted by their states to be distributing the vax, to be giving the vaccines, uh, you know, it could be like five o'clock in the afternoon and the pharmacist realizes he's got a, a couple of vials that he's gonna have to discard and it's almost closing time, people didn't show up. So the pharmacist goes on a PA system and says, I got uh, eight shots left. Anybody in the store want to get vaccinated against COVID? And that's what's happening. People show up. So again, you're already kind of where the people are instead of making the people come to you. Now, of course, a lot of that, a lot of the modern pharmacies, they're you know they're they're part of supermarkets or they're just big stores that have a lot of other things that they sell besides the the prescription drugs. And and then there are also community pharmacies. West Virginia has done a great job of getting getting people vaccinated using community pharmacies that know their people and they're in rural areas. So another advantage of expanding the scope of practice of pharmacists is it helps get a lot of routine care 
to the people closer to where they are. They don't have to travel. They don't have to take time off. They don't have to spend as much money. Um, it's a, it should be a no brainer, at least if you're interested in what's good for the patient. And, and so uh, I, I, I don't see how this is not going to continue, especially after we've had a year now where people are being exposed to the various ways in which the other healthcare professions besides the medical profession can be helping us out and have been helping us out. So I think that this uh, provides a really, um, I, I think we don't realize how lucky we have been, how fortunate we've been in the past year. We had a vaccine, we have a vaccine that's being delivered and administered today in less than a year after the first confirmed COVID, vaccine, uh, COVID um, uh, diagnosis in the United States. That is, that is the first time that's ever happened. The next fastest vaccine was four years. So we are now in, you know, we've been incredibly fortunate that this was the, the, the medical innovation as well as the bureaucratic obstacles were, you know, were, were the innovation occurred fast enough to have that vaccine developed that quickly, but also the bureaucratic obstacles were removed fast enough in order to actually get people dosed. And we had the unfortunate news this morning that one of that vaccine trials has been ended. We know that Moderna is now working on a booster for the variant of COVID. We don't know how this virus will mutate. We don't know how, you know, we know that these two vaccines are incredibly effective. The FDA was hoping for about 50% efficacy and we're looking at 95% for the first two vaccines that have rolled out here in the US. Um, it, it's, it's just, a, you know, it, it, things could, really couldn't have gone that much better in terms of having a vaccine, but we don't know what is going to happen next. Can you talk about what the scenarios might look like in terms of an even greater demand for pharmacists going forward, different scenarios, and, and very quickly. And also, what do people need to know about your recent paper? If they want to make change, they want to push policy at the state level, what is it that you want them to know that your paper says that will be the best instruction for them? You want to go first, Courtney, on this? Sure. Yeah. And just to your to your second question about what do I want people to take away, because it kind of relates to my answer to the first, is I hope that the paper provides a good background, but also sort of a uh, play by play of what the current environment looks like. And my hope is that the takeaway is that this is kind of a starting point. And I, I hope that it serves as sort of a um, inspiration is the wrong word, but like, I hope that it kind of can serve as a model for like, okay, well then what about, why don't we try this this time or this this time? Um, so I hope that it really demonstrates the value of the reforms we've had so far, but also sort of like maybe spark some other type of innovation when it comes to, to scope of practice reform for pharmacists. Um, now that we've lived through a pandemic, um, you know, and we've seen vast examples of how the medical system can be improved, I think that that for me has kind of gotten me thinking more about this and where can we go from what the paper explains. Um, and so that's kind of what I hope people take away from it is that you just see that this is important. And then to, to your first question, um, which is related, is what other scenarios do I see this? I think overall, maybe not, you know, the uh, the doomsday scenario that I think we've all had a little bit too much doomsday in the last year, to be honest. Um, so I won't give any like specific scenarios, but what I will say is this has given us a great example of what happens when your uh, medical care system is not robust. And by that, I mean, able to meet the challenges that arise. And this is obviously hard to do in a highly regulated environment, which again, it, it's understandable to see how we got to where we are. The problem is, we have not reassessed regularly where we are to see if there's something that maybe we can throw out. Um, and so that that's kind of what I think uh, we need to see is or be thinking about in terms of like what's next is how can we make our system based on what we know now, based on the fact that we've been living through this pandemic, how can we make the healthcare system more robust and more accessible to people when they need it? Because if we, if we roll back a lot of these, um, 
relaxed, you know, executive orders and, and regulations that were temporarily suspended. If we go back to the status quo, I think we're just basically uh, doing, you know, Americans a great disservice in terms of saying that, well, you know, we'll, we'll, cons we'll reconsider if there's another public health emergency. We don't, we really don't have time for that. We need to, to be serious about the reforms we've already done and put those into place permanently so that if something like this happens again, um, we're no longer dealing with the same problems we have. And then we're able to sort of use that as a springboard into maybe other reforms. And I like to say that uh, it's, it's important to remind everyone, we started working on this paper before there was such a thing as COVID-19. So um, it just made it more kind of more meaningful. But I think the, the, the point of our paper is that uh, there is so much that can be done on the state level to uh, improve access and affordability to healthcare and to move in a direction of patient autonomy. Uh, on the, everybody always looks to Washington, but there's so much more innovation that can take place at a state level without having to wait for Washington to act. Now it's up to Washington to give patients their full autonomy back because they took away their right to self-medicate, but states could still mitigate a lot of those effects. So I see in the short run, we have a list in our paper of, of what I call low hanging fruit, uh, things that many states are already doing, like allowing pharmacists to perform certain tests, like tuberculosis tests, test and treat for the flu and for uh, strep throat, and and you know prescribe oral contraceptives and uh, extend prescriptions. We have a lot of recommendations that that are not unique. There's some some states are already doing this, and we think every state should be doing it. But I would like to see going forward that there are a whole host of drugs that other developed nations make available to their patients, either over the counter or through the pharmacist behind the counter, that third way. For example, people in Canada don't have to go to a doctor's office to get a prescription for insulin. They can walk into a pharmacy and get insulin. And, uh, and, and there's, I could, you know, and in the UK, you can get certain statin drugs and albuterol inhaler for your asthma right from the pharmacist without having to get a prescription where in the United States you have to. So we're, so it, going forward, I would go after some of that not so low hanging fruit. And I think states should look at uh, also allowing pharmacists to prescribe things like insulin and uh, butyrol inhaler and statin drugs. And there's a whole host of other drugs because the FDA simply says, this is not available to anyone without a prescription from a healthcare practitioner licensed by the state, but it's up to the state side what their licensed healthcare practitioners scope of practice will be. And so at least this will, going forward, I think we should get more bold and not do just what's being done in other states. So um, we have really had a wonderful privilege to have Courtney Jocelyn and Dr. Jeffrey Singer talk to us today about their recent paper on pharmacy scope. And I think really, I think illustrate in a very concrete way what access and affordability mean and what they might mean going forward. And so for those of you, thank you for joining us today to learn more about this really important issue. But I think that's the big lesson that we have is that in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, that the, the, to the patient, the meaning of access and affordability is real. It, touch, it has touched every single person in this country. And I think that is the kind of, this is the kind of example that we really need to amplify, particularly as, you know, the healthcare is so divisive. Whenever you're talking about access and affordability on the state level, there's a real appetite for reform. And I think we can continue to push these types of narratives forward in order to impact meaningful and permanent change in our healthcare system. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to R Street for hosting this wonderful event. And please know that you can go to the R Street website to learn more. Um, and once again, I'm Naomi Lopez, Director of Healthcare Policy at the Goldwater Institute. Thank you for, thank you for participating today. Thank you.